All right, we're just going to jump into panel three right now. Thank you all for coming out tonight. Um, so we have almost everyone's from Brooklyn. How many people in the audience are from Brooklyn? We also have one fellow from Queens. Okay, so uh, Costa, we were, Costa and I were going to do a one-on-one, -on -one, but he, he uh, graciously chose to join the panel. So I'm going to be modifying my questions as, as we go along here, uh, because I was doing, this was an all Brooklyn panel up until that moment. So uh, my apologies if you feel a little left out, but you shouldn't because, because there's a lot of, a lot of uh, common ground here. But uh, our icebreaker question is Brooklyn-centric. So we want to know, honestly, where you stand on things. Please tell us, do the right thing, Moonstruck, or Saturday Night Fever? <laughs> you sit down on the other costume and come around. Do the right thing? <laughs> uh, do the right thing, gotta be. Okay. Our Bridgeport, 35th District, do the right thing. All right. Well, we got the mic over here. Of course, do the right thing. It's historical, it's iconic, it's everything that Brooklyn is about. I am here to tell you that I'm gonna do the right thing. <laughs> I have to go with Saturday Night Fever. It was filmed in the hardware store around the corner from where I work currently, so that's where John Travolta worked, and I gotta stay with the, the hometown hero. <laughs> Uh, I have here the correct answer, which is actually Vampire in Brooklyn. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, right. Uh, the, everyone knows the song, No Sleep Till Brooklyn. And I think we can actually sleep now because Brooklynification is everywhere. If I go into one more bar with reclaimed wood and craft beer, I will lose my mind. <laughs> but that Brooklyn... And, and, and really what we have with, with, with the outer boroughs, I think Brooklyn has moved into, into Queens, one can make that argument, that, that what it is is this idea of something being artistic or artisanal and of high quality and craftsmanship, right? So my question is, has Brooklyn left us behind? Is it too late? And using any of the planks, please tell us anything, uh, how we at our level can grow in the shadow of something like the Barclay Center and other huge developments that are happening everywhere. You have two minutes to respond. We're gonna start down here with Costa. All right, so I, I'm gonna answer the question and I have to do it real quick. <laughs> <laughs> Great, do it. Uh, my name's Costa Constantinidis. I'm proud to represent uh, the 22nd District, which includes I call it Art Storia, someone else today called it Act Storia, but however you want to put it. Um, and I, I, I agree with you that uh, when you think about Queens, uh, you would think about high quality art, um, as I just alluded to with Art Storia, Art Storia. I think that we've done a lot of the good things in the city council, whether that's arts education, uh, whether that's uh, the CII, uh, using that, that CII, the Cultural Immigrant Initiative, it's making sure that we bring that great diversity, that, that strength, that, that tapestry of who we are, um, and strengthening those individual tenants of that tapestry and plugging them into the DCLA. You know, what is the DCLA? How, does, how, does the, how do they get funding? How, does the, how can these groups get plugged in? I was proud to host a multicultural festival in Astoria Park for the first time and making it an annual event, bringing in 12, 13 different organizations to perform in Astoria Park um, to celebrate those cultures. And also, but also plug them into what is going on in the art scene. Um, again, looking at funding organizations uh, to bring the arts to NYCHA, uh, whether that's the Lower Christian Society performing with our residents in public housing, whether that's bringing Sukasa and bringing arts into our senior centers, providing additional programming there, whether it's uh, working with our kids, I talked about before CASA, about what can we do as part of these tenants, right? That's what you had talked about before. Uh, what can we do better? Uh, it's looking for those, what is our neighborhood? What is the character of our neighborhood? Is it building? or is it the people that make up that neighborhood? And if, if, if it is that second part, then we have to start focusing on how we build spaces for people and keep it affordable 
and not focus on, well, this is what the heights are and have always have been. It's more about how do we keep the people who made our neighborhoods great in those neighborhoods for the long term. <laughs> I guess I'll stop there. <laughs> always go out on an applause. Note. That's it. That's it. Good, good ending note. Um, good, after, good evening, everyone. My name is Corey Provost, and I am a candidate for the City Council District of 41 uh, in Brooklyn, which is the neighborhoods of Brownsville, Ocean Hill, Bedford Stuyvesant, Crown Heights, and East Flatbush. And uh, just to get jump right to the question, has Brooklyn left us behind? I, I, I don't think so. There is so much, I think, still left in Brooklyn um, when we think about what we can do from an art standpoint, when we can utilize the city as our, as our canvas. You know, there's so much property, so much uh, space. We just think we have to rethink how we're gonna utilize uh, some of this open space. And, uh, I was proud to be with Artbridge uh, earlier this year. They unveiled the mural of the Blanks and Keys houses. And I think when we, when we look at how we have, again, the space that is there already, that is empty, that is somewhat barren um, in look, we can invite local artists, neighborhood artists, to come in and do different kinds of projects on that kind of uh, space. So I think when we look from the city council, you know, as a council member, I would love to be able to sponsor initiatives like that, where we're just, again, bringing, uh, rethinking how we're looking at art and uh, art utilizing the city um, in, in that way. Hi, uh, so again, yeah, my name is Jabari Brisport, and I'm running in the 35th District, also known as the BAM Cultural District, and has Brooklyn left us behind? In parts of my district, yeah. Yeah, it has. A lot of people have been priced out, especially artists. And a part of it's been done by this technique that was perfected by developers of my district, which is using people like you and people like me, I'm an artist too, as the battering ram of gentrification. But they come with all this glitz and glamour about all the amazing artistic spaces they're going to build, and then very quietly sneak all these luxury condos in. Yeah. You guys know Peter for you audience? Yeah. yeah. It's lovely, right? It's a lovely space. Okay, what you might not know is that it was redeveloped or redesigned or you know, rebuilt, refurbished by Jonathan Rose Companies. And Jonathan Rose Companies is a darling of the arts. They do so much for culture and they're green and everyone loves them. But after they got their permit to develop a theater for a new audience in 2013, two years later they go down the block and they purchase 15 Lafayette Avenue for one dollar and they do it on the promise of affordable housing and thousands and thousands of square feet of, of, um, cultural, of cultural space and tons of partnerships with Mark Morris. And it sounds great for artists until you look at the rents. Because the majority are way out of price. Their market rates, so basically condos, are unaffordable. And of the parts that are affordable, half are earmarked to 130% of AMI. If you don't know what that means, it means it's affordable if you're making $80,000 a year. Does any artist in this room make $80,000 a year? <laughs> Did any artist make $80,000 in the past two years? <laughs> Call me crazy, but I think that developers that wrap themselves up in the arts I think you wrap yourself up in the arts for good public relations, you should build homes that artists can afford to live in. Yeah. So yeah, I'm an artist, and like Edward, I did a little improv, so I say yes and to your, your platform, and I say yes to designating cultural zones within the city, and in districts like mine that are high and very dense in culture, mandatory inclusionary housing for artists when we're building affordable housing. Thank you. Good evening, I'm so happy to be back and so happy to have had your support uh, the last election cycle. It's an honor to be back and it's been an honor to represent you uh, over the last four years. One of the things that struck me as so many of the candidates were speaking compared to last year's election cycle, which is so inspiring, is that for me, I was coming in as the first artist, arts professional um, into the city council. And why that's important is because what I learned, your issues do not get addressed if you are not there. So the concept or the idea or the reality of so many artists, people from the creative community stepping up for the really first time in history in large numbers to run for public office is powerful. I know that as a city council member, when I walk into the room, um, and they've already decided things, or at the hearing, and they see my presence, they know, oh, we gotta start all over again. She's gonna be upset <laughs> if we don't mention the arts in it. And that's so critical and that's so important. When we came in, uh, one of the things that was uh, so important was the work that you did pushed so many of the legislators around legislation as it, as it pertained to theater. So Ben Kalos, 
awesome. I'm happy to co-sponsor the legislation to make sure that we have affordable spaces in city government all throughout to make sure that you can utilize that space. We've had tremendous pushback, but we're gonna continue to push back but forums like this, as I'm sitting here, are also so critical because it's important that this doesn't happen every four years. We have to continue to have this type of dialogue so that we can continue to meet and continue to hold elected officials accountable all throughout four years. Because if you, if you let people off the hook for four years, they're not gonna think about your issues in that way. So thinking about it from an electoral perspective, this is powerful, more artists running, and have we left many people behind? Yes, we have, but there's still so much that we can do to address these critical issues. Thank you. Hi again, my name is Khadr El Yatim. I am an Arab, Palestinian, American, Democrat, a preacher in the 43rd district in Brooklyn, New York. <laughs> And I'm sure many of you might be surprised to see a person wearing a collar running for city council, but I believe uh, that I'm running for a reason, to represent my community, and honored to be here tonight. And the whole conversation was tonight about what we can do for you, but really it is also what you can do for us, uh, because I believe the independent actors can change and challenge our reality and open and expand our horizons. But I am, before I came here, when this, I received this invitation to be with you, I met with a few of the artists in our community to speak about the challenges and the things that they have dealing with on an everyday basis. And it is so sad to see in our beautiful district, the 43rd district, we don't have one space where artists can go to practice, they can perform, and they can call home. It is really a sad reality. The only place they had to perform and practice was in the basement of our church. Wow. Uh, and, and we offered them that space, but I need to see in our community a place where these artists, the independence artists, have a place to call home. And I need to work on this with all of them to make sure we have a center, we have a place that they can practice. My daughter, who's 12 years old this year, did two shows, Aladdin, and the other show, I will tell you what she did. She was the witch of the east. So you can go <laughs> So she came to me and said, Dad, I want to ask you a question. They asked me at the school if I can be the witch. And I said, I will get back to you because you are a pastor. I said, honey, come on, you got to do it. So, so I need to fight for you because I'm fighting for my daughter, who she, all what she wants to be in life is be a singer. So thank you. Good evening. My name is John Quaglione. I'm also running in the 43rd district of Bay Ridge, Diker, Bensonhurst, and Bath Beach in Brooklyn. And I think to say that uh, Brooklyn has left you behind would be uh, a mistake. And it's actually in our, our neck of the woods and in other parts of the borough, as we're hearing, we need you more than ever to come into our neighborhood and to put on those shows. This past December at the Fort Hamilton Army Base, as, as our pastor said, the space is such an issue in our neighborhood that they rent out the theater at the Fort Hamilton Army Base. And a, a producer, for the first time ever, had his show perform um, that I took my daughter to, the a community theater presentation, um, The Most Miserable Christmas Tree. And <laughs> it was phenomenal. And it was right there. It was $15. It was actors that were just starting out young, um, uh, youthful, full of life, and full of talent. And they were right there, no more than 15, 20 bucks from my house. I was able to take my daughter and my niece on a Sunday afternoon at two o'clock, again, for $15. So that's why when you look at um, the programs that involve with the business improvement districts that they're developing here in, in our district and throughout the city, Maybe the city, the small business services needs to look to incorporate community theater space when they when they approve when they approve those um, business improvement districts. And and just to just to leave a, a final point, I think to Councilmember Cumbo's point, it is critical that not only are you becoming involved and getting involved and staying involved and running candidates, but that we get that com that in economic impact study done and show truly what what you are doing and what you're all about and what you're contributing to our city. Thank you.
Moving right along, doing very well. Our lightning round questions. Raise your hands if you are willing to be a co-sponsor to Ben Kalis' City Spaces Initiative to create a searchable database of unused or underutilized city-owned spaces. Uh, you will clearly and visibly list your stances on issues facing indie theater and the performing arts in your campaign's website and literature. Sure. Thank you. We appreciate it if you actually use the term indie theater, too. Um, you support the commission of a comprehensive impact study for independent theaters similar to the one recently published by the University of Pittsburgh on culture and arts impact on New York City neighborhoods. Yes. And read that study. And you, have a chance to uh, you support campaign finance reform and getting big money out of political campaigns at all levels. Yes. <laughs> Uh, you support adding indie theater artists to the qualifications to get approval for affordable housing. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You, help, you support helping indie artists find ways to purchase affordable places to live. You support expanding the theater subdistrict fund to include arts organizations with budgets below $250,000 a year. Um, and you promise to see at least three indie theater productions before the elections, <laughs> including, but not limited to, <laughs> my production of Martin Benton, Martin Benton here in this space, July 6th through the 23rd, <laughs> 7 p.m. tickets are 20 or 25 <laughs> 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 Need the, this list given to us. The <laughs> What's the comp situation with that? <laughs> uh, are you an actor? <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, all right. So uh, pulling into the station here, um, Costa Queens was uh, in in 2015. Lonely Planet named it the number one destination for tourists, not Manhattan. Sorry, not Brooklyn, but Queens. But Brooklyn is Sorry, often Brooklyn. visited by folks who come strictly to see Brooklyn as well. So we often are dealing with spaces, and, and we, have, we have 99 seats or less, but I often will be in shows where we're like, OK, if we have less audience members, we, we feel OK, because at least we can take them. You know, because there's eight of us, and there's six of them. <laughs> right? I always say two's an audience, one's a rehearsal, as far as audience members are concerned. But, um, and I will perform if there's at least one person that's out there. Uh, other people won't. But um, what can we do to, I mean, I've, I've mentioned the 61 million tourists that come to New York City every year. But what can we do to get them to come because there is indie theater that's here? Most of the productions are only around for three weeks. Um, most of them, we can't afford to spend 3000 5000 or whatever dollars it costs to get a PR person to promote it. We are not on bulletin boards. We are not on buses. Uh, we, you, you have to know about us. So what can we do to get the tourists to see what we're doing? Um, also, what, what do you... What would you do to create a cultural district that is centered around the smaller artists in your area? Or what can you do to elevate that? Uh, you have two minutes to respond. So, <coughs> and right now I know that the Historic Performing Arts Center is putting on a performance of Raisins coming up in May that is very exciting for everyone. And it's how do we get, how do we amplify that? Well, the biggest question I ask, and you know, they've come to see me and other arts organizations have come to see me, is we need performance space. We need consistent performance space. And we need affordable uh, performance space. Now, how do we do that? Well, looking at rezoning, as we build rezonings, it cannot be towers of with a moat around them where it's that their development and this is our development. These developments have to be integrated into our community. And there has to be a real give back from developers. Uh, that en 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 enriches this neighborhood, that all votes rise from these developments, or we all lose. 
It can't just be, well, we got this number of affordable housing, we got this piece. It has to be all of it and it has to be part of the neighborhood. Then secondly, you know, and so building those performance spaces has to be part of that conversation. And ensuring that they're there, they're there for the long term, that residents who are actors and performers can be in those neighborhoods to help bring out those, uh, those conversations. Secondly, about arts, we have a, uh, the Athens Square Park in the middle of our district. We also have this, where the Astoria Performing Arts Center performs. We have the Variety Boys and Girls Club, which is looking to do a performance space along the 21st Street line where there's so much development happening. That whole western portion of our district, we also incorporate the Hallett's Cove uh, Peninsula, which has been traditionally underserved. We need to make a network there for art. We need to start with, the, uh, with Athens Square Park, that there are already performances going on there, but do more. Ensure that uh, as we're building out, as we see you know, the, the two new developments coming down the pike potentially, West Cove and, and Hell's Gate, which are supposed to be a thousand units apiece, that there's performance spaces there. And that we link those performance spaces with an overall arts district in Western Queen, and then have them connected by the ferry and city <coughs> bike. Because the other part of this is transportation, it's making sure that we can get people to the performances. Yeah. But then the biggest problem we've had in Queens is that, <laughs> is that the seven train and the, the trains on the weekends do not run well. So we have to make sure that we have other modes of transportation. I, I hear you. <laughs> I hear you, I swear. But we have to also build out a transportation network to get people to this, get people to our performances that don't go dormant on Friday and Saturday and Sunday. I think when I think about the 41st Council District, we have uh, pockets, right? So we have these pockets of, of spaces that people can utilize already. We have the Brownsville Heritage Center, we have the Leesville um, Ultra Heritage Center. And, you know, a lot of programs and a lot of activities go on there, but I would love to see a historic district within uh, this councilmatic district in particular, where we can get that as the, the, to be just like the official space where people know and you can advertise it, put it through city publications create uh, real coalitions between the already people on the ground that are doing a lot of the community work. The people that go day in, day out, that plan, put on productions, put on um, various uh, efforts to make sure that there's some kind of programmatic uh, things happening in the community. But now it's just tying them together, really getting a real strong coalition going, then we could see how we could tie in, again, city council funding, um, the, the mayor's office, to get the, the, a real strength, a real push behind it so they can get the word out about what's going on in the community. Uh, I don't think we need, I mean, I would love new space, new um, uh, development within the district that can um, go towards this, but I think we have space. We have things, again, we just have to rethink what we already have. There is so much retail space um, for the, the city has already within this, within this district that we can utilize it a little better, whether it's utilizing the community centers, the senior centers, to house on some of these uh, initiatives. I think we can do that within this council district. So I would just like to see that all just come together through a strong coalition um, building. So hi, I'm Jabbar here again. And uh, so first question is how we get more tourists to see independent theater. And what I would love to see is a partnership with the Broadway Playbills, where we get a full uh, spread that says, here's the independent theater scene. I think it should link to the LIT site, and I think you guys have a full calendar of what's going on in the uh, independent theater scene throughout New York. And I think that's a great partnership. And I think rather than paying marketing fees, it should be free. And we'll know it's free because we'll get the, in, uh, the economic impact statement of independent theater and how much it brings into New York City. Second question, how do we get more indie centers? We've all heard the term income inequality, but I'd like to talk to you about artistic inequality. Mm. Brooklyn received $12, $12 million in cultural funding last year. Over nine million of that went to my district. One district in Brooklyn, that's a lot. And you know, we need to share. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, I'm not even gonna mince around it, we need to share. And you know, a lot of that's because of the, you know, we have so many of the cultural, in, uh, the cultural institution groups there with uh, BAM and Brooklyn Museum and the Brooklyn Library. But if the definition of cultural institute group leads to artistic inequality, then we need to go to number nine on your platform, which means we need to redefine what is a cultural institution group and include independent theater. Yeah. Yeah. That, means, 
And that means independent uh, theaters like Jack, which is in Clint Hill, it's a fantastic little independent theater, and I think it's one of the newest additions to the LL League of Independent Theaters, because it's sent your platform, and so you're building out in Brooklyn now, you're welcome. Uh, I think, I think uh, organizations like that can start to build once they get more funding, and thanks. I want to say guilty as charged for bringing home the lion's share of cultural resources to my district. <laughs> quite a ferocious fighter, but I, I wanted to add with that, one of the things that just boils me, boils my blood in this instance is the, co the concept of a cultural district, right? So we talk about these cultural districts, we've got the downtown Brooklyn cultural district, we have all these different cultural districts, but what angers me about it is that these cultural districts are just names. In other states, cultural districts have legal designations that come with resources, that come with certain legal uh, ramifications. So for instance, I've introduced legislation to create actual legalized cultural districts. What that would mean is that in those spaces, you would have the ability to have artist housing specific because trying to pass legislation or to utilize preferences for artist housing is very difficult, um, almost near impossible. There are some projects that have been able to, but I want it to be that way. I want our schools and universities to take on that mandate as well, that they have special designations in terms of arts performances, education, and so on and so forth. The other aspect about it that's so critical that also boils me, you have, not in a, also in addition to the zoning, but also you have all of these corporations like Target, H&M, Aeropostale, all of these different big box stores that come into our cultural district and they give no resources of any meaning to these not-for-profit organizations that are in the area. If you're gonna do business in the city, you have to be able to support those cultural districts. So one of the things that I really want to see that I'm passionate about is that we make sure that when you're in a cultural district, you can't just advertise as a developer, I'm a, moving to the downtown Brooklyn cultural district minutes away from so-and-so, and you're not putting any money into the cultural community to make sure that the artists that live there can stay there, the cultural institutions, the not-for-profits that are operating there, that are selling your luxury condominiums, can actually live and thrive there. So that is one of the main goals of this. So thank you, you did a very good introduction. Now I know where all the money is because I have, <laughs> I have a very sad reality in my district. Uh, <laughs> the government allocated $3.43 for every person in Brooklyn. My district received only 31 cents for a person. That's why the independent actors and, uh, are suffering in my district. That's why they are facing hardships, and unfortunately, the elected officials in my district have not reached out to help them and address this issue, even though they have been working on it day in and day out. So I think we have a lot of work to do to help the uh, artist community, the, theater, the independent theater community. Uh, it is about find, allocating the appropriate funding so they can do what they need to do to bring to us the arts, to challenge our realities, to expand our horizons, to address issues that is difficult, that we are shy to speak about. So this is what I think will be very important. But the other thing is, uh, uh, still talking about the space and home, that is, must be a reality. In our neighborhood, we cannot talk even about affordable housing because there is no space for affordable housing. People are sometimes stand against it. I work with the HUD 202, I was able to secure funding to build uh, affordable housing and the board directors in that organization vote against it even though we're approved from the first time. So we need to help our community to be more accepting of, of, of the artists who live there, to allow them to do the best work they do, to continue to uh, bring us to a place of conversation and dialogue, to grow in our relationship as neighbors and, and as community. Thank you. Again, we're, we're um, from the same area and we see the same problems that are facing the, the independent theater and the artists in, in our part of Southwest Brooklyn. Um, just on the tourism, there's no reason why NYC and company cannot put something together that they do for restaurant week, um, for um, uh, two for one Broadway show week. They should have independent theater week. Um, maybe, maybe twice a year in the spring and the fall. 
they should put put you guys listed in in the um, the pamphlets that they put out that they give out at senior centers and at at uh, airports and this this it's like common sense to promote but you get that impact study done and you can go in there I'll go with you if I'm elected I'll go with your membership and we'll sit down with the director of New York and company and say look this is how many people we're employing this is how much tax revenue is coming you have to do something for this industry you have to create an independent theater week you have to create a, pr a promotional a aspect for these organizations to, to go out there. When we had a movie theater in our district, Change Hands, it was sold, the Alpine Theater. We worked with the owner to guarantee that one of the th movie theaters in the place would be used, dedicated for a community theater. Because we have the Narrows Community Theater, we have a number of groups that always calling us. That, um, where can we do our show? We want a show, we need space, we need space. And like I believe you said earlier, Corey, they built the theater, the theater took over, and the community theater space never came to be. We have a school right now being built, and the community board gave an extension for a seventh floor so that they can have a community theater in addition to the new school that they're building. So we need to um, maximize the space, as, as the pastor said, and we need to get more money into our district, but we need New York City and company to recognize what you really mean to the New York economy, and they need to stand by us. Great, so uh, we're gonna do our one minute wrap up, and I, I'm gonna put a special spin on this one. I'm gonna ask uh, some of you are already in office, and some of you are, are, are running for office, so whether you're in office or whether you are in the future getting elected, how can we, come to you and engage with you to meet our needs. How can anyone out here who has their own company just go to one of you individually without the League of Independent Theater themselves and come to you with their issue? And what do we need to do to create a dialogue with you on an ongoing way? Uh, I wanna say uh, it's been an honor and a privilege to represent the 22nd District and to have the support of Lyft the first time I had the opportunity to run. Um, I actually, still into my fourth year, read my own emails. Every single email, costa.council.nyc.gov, every letter you send me, every email you send is read by me first. And that means it takes a little longer <laughs> because I have to read all of it. Um, but I make sure that I read every email. So if you want to start a dialogue with me, you can reach out to me on social media, you can write me a letter, you can email me because I will read it first. And we can have those conversations. And, we can have a real dialogue. Like Ed Koch said, you know, 12, you agree with me, 12 times out of 12, we both get our heads checked. Um, <laughs> but we can have, we can constantly go back and forth with one another. Um, you know, thing, looking forward, and the things I just wanna leave you with, is that there's a quirk in the zoning law that allows for a bulk bonus. That doesn't need a variance, doesn't need a Euler. All it has to be is a community facility space. And they can build it without any permission. And what's happening in my district, they're building lots of doctor's offices. Uh, we're seeing that on a consistent basis. Now I have a couple of proposals, I'm the environmental chair of on environmental, but we should expand that to the arts and incentivize that building and make sure that that's part of our zoning conversation. So that's one minute. I, I'm deeply honored to have uh, the support last time. I hope to earn your support this time. Thank you very much. First, I want to say thank you for having me. Again, my name is Corey Provost, running for City Council in the 41st Compromatic District. And you can tweet me, you can Facebook me, you can LinkedIn me, you can, I can give you my card after the meeting. Um, and I can have my contact information. I love, so I'm open for the dialogue. I encourage the dialogue um, around this matter. So I, I, you know, I'm definitely a friend to this organization and as well to its members independently. Um, and just to wrap up, you know, I believe I've had one of the strongest track records of the candidates running in this race as far as it relates to arts education. Uh, I formerly worked for New York City Controller Scott Stringer and one of the first audits that he put out um, when I began there also and just happened to be part of that team was one that analyzed arts education and the lack thereof of arts instruction in Central Brooklyn and the South Bronx schools. And based off that report, the city council, uh, the council members, were able to uh, add an additional $25 million to arts education uh, for our public school system. As 
And, and lastly, you know, um, you know, as also on the education front, you know, in my district we have fought against co-location opportunities from the city to help push back against um, public schools that have been lost, that may have lost their uh, art space. So again, Jabari Brisford, 35th District, and I know I said already I'm an artist. What I haven't told you yet is I like I love political theater. I've been working on it for 10 years, and probably the first piece I ever made was a spoken word piece about uh, same-sex marriage and how awful it is to not be able to visit the person you love in a hospital. And I did it all over um, NYU when I went there for undergrad, and I even took it back to my high school that I did there, coupled with a speech about being in the closet um, as a high school student. and. Months later, a high school student Facebook messaged me and told me that that speech and that performance uh, gave him the courage to come out of the closet. And that's what I think is so important about theater is that we shine so goddamn bright that we ignite the people around us. And over the next four years, when we have fascists in the White House, can you guys agree to shine brighter? When people are threatening to cut funding for the NEA, can you agree to shine brighter? Okay, so if you want to get in contact with me, what you can do is you can come to our campaign launch party tomorrow. It is at Arts Cafe and Bar in Brooklyn. And we are, we are fires outside. I'll see you there. I don't drive, so I'm on the bus and the train, so you can always catch me there. But where you will be most impactful is to see all of these faces on the steps of City Hall. The ability to take over the steps, the ability to interrupt the way we do business on a day-to-day -day basis is the best way for you to make an impact and for the electeds to hear you. And I also wanna say in terms of indie theater, it's so important, and I believe this, like when we look at so many of the initiatives that have come forward, like Vision Zero, it's important that it comes from the top down. When this administration from the top down recognizes the power and the impact of the arts, we will see true change, and it's our job to influence that. I would say in the time that I've been in the city council, I've been proud to expand the Theaters of Color initiative from eight organizations to over 30. I was able to increase, in addition to that, utility relief. So for all cultural institutions, theater groups that are on cultural space, that are doing cultural programming, they will no longer have to pay to their utilities. In addition to that, I created the first ever anti-gun violence initiative utilizing the arts and theater. So there's so much more work to be done, and that $10 million we got was measly. We have to make sure that we get the full 40 and match it with another 40 from corporate as well as foundational organizations. So thank you so much for being an honor to represent me. Let us give hands to our fan keeper. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, at the end of the day, it comes down to two things, funding and space. Yep. And that's what I will work on when I am elected to office, is to secure the funding, to identify a place, designate that space to be called home to the uh, independent theater in our community. Uh, uh, it, it is not easy, but it is doable. And when we have commit the commitment and the passion, we can go after it and we can make it happen. Mm -hmm. So I just wanna thank you. We have four Democrats in our um, uh, district running for office. I am the only Democrat who showed up tonight because I care about uh, this, I care about what you guys do, and I, I met with members of uh, 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 the art community in my uh, district before I came here to meet with you to get a sense of what their struggles and what they need. So I hope you appreciate this, and I have my partner here from the Republican side, the Republican who showed up tonight. So you got the best Republican and the best Democrats for including you tonight. So, so I hope we'll get your support. Thank you. <laughs> Just to, uh, for the contact, John Quaglione for City Council 2017 on Facebook. We're on Twitter, Instagram, and, and LinkedIn as well. But again, going back to, to what I was saying earlier, we are the off, off, we're as far off Broadway as you can be on the southwest part of Brooklyn. And, and there are many senior citizens living in our district. There are many young families that have never really left Brooklyn, that haven't left our neighborhood, that have never gone to Broadway. It's, it's, it's 
to an off-Broadway theater, to a theater like this. So to bring it home to us, that's why when I said earlier that you has Brooklyn left you, Brooklyn needs you. So we need you to come back to come back to our neck of the woods, and and I, I welcome my colleague's commitment, as is mine, to being the uh, voice to finding finally a permanent theater for so we don't have to use the top of a school or the back of a movie theater or the basement of a church. We can have a real theater where we can have performances that are top quality that you guys produce and that we can have people get the full theater experience. Thank you very much and we hope you both can come to close. Mr. Guy Yedwa. Hey, hey everyone, thank you again all for coming. Um, thanks to all the candidates, all the candidates from the earlier panels. Is this microphone working or not working? Yeah, no, it's being a little wonky at the... Can you hear me now? Yeah. Great. I wouldn't predict, but there's also the live stream. Hello to everyone on the internet. Hello to everyone on the video. Thank you. Um, Thank you all for coming. I want you all to give a huge round of applause to all the volunteers, to Chris, to Katie, to Emily, to Robert, to everyone who made this. You have all put on events. You know how crazy this is to do. So we really appreciate everyone who put in the sweat to make this happen. Thanks to everyone who helped us with press, Jonathan Slav and Edie Nugent, who helped us put get press in the house so that we can help spread the word on that. Thanks to Ares and the Crane Theater for bringing us a space. We talk so much about space, and this is where we are. So thank you all. So now I just want to briefly say one thing about what happens next, and then we can all go on our merry way, and you can talk to these people and ask them more specific questions and find out more. We heard a lot of really great ideas tonight and things that we want to see happen. Now we need to make it happen. I didn't come out here to tell you that this is the end of the night. I'm telling you this is the start, okay? So here's what you need to do to be part of this process. All right, step one. Everyone got, when they came in, a yellow sheet that's the endorsement survey, all right? So the League of Independent Theater, we can actually endorse candidates for office. They love the arts, that's why they're here. <laughs> but we wanna know who, who impressed you, who didn't impress you. There are a couple candidates who literally, they were so passionate to be here, they just walked in off the street. So you might need to write in a name on those ballots, but please fill those out, give that to anyone with a lit pin, uh, and that's how we're gonna help uh, choose who's going to be there. All right, then we're going to announce who we've endorsed, and that brings us to step two. We're gonna put out a voter guide, and we're gonna tell you who in which district is being endorsed, and then we're gonna try and organize to get you guys to help volunteer for them. Because endorsing them is nice, going out, knocking doors, but making phone calls, I think we've all seen over the last few months that you actually have to be out there and you actually have to be heard. And then, yes, the step three, as we've said a lot of times, vote! September, November, we're gonna vote. And once we finish step three, we'll keep doing it all over again. We're gonna keep talking to these folks. Once they're elected, we're gonna keep working with them to get legislation, but that's how we're gonna get it done. So thank you all for being here. <laughs> if you have any questions, comments, concerns, facial expressions, or anything else with the kids, thank you all, and have a great night.